All right, I just right. want to go back because sure. I left out a couple of uh, items about my uh, grandkids. Mike's daughter, Samantha, is at McAllister College. That's okay. where she's graduating. I forgot to mention my newest and youngest grandchild, Emilio, who is my daughter. Joe's, Joe is married to Sam Enriquez, who's a, uh, edit a front page editor at the Wall Street Journal, and Emilio just turned 11. He mm -hmm. goes to uh, school in New York, uh, the Bank Street School, where Joe, te Joe teaches as well as Jill. And uh, Terry, uh, also graduated from Duke. Mike graduated from Duke Undergraduate School. Duke, Terry graduated from Duke Law School and practices law now part-time with IBM. Uh, so I think I've covered all of my five kids and the 16 grandkids are a great joy in my life and I stay in close touch with all of them. Uh, Jill's children, I should have mentioned, uh, Molly is her next to last year at Westminster College in Utah. Max is a second year student at Drexel. Uh, Julia is going to be starting college in the fall. And Emily is a high school junior. She's doing a special program in Idaho. So they are a very big part of my life. And I'm blessed because Four of my five children live within 40 minutes of my house. The only one that's not nearby is Carrie, who's out in Los Angeles, but I'm going to go visit her in a couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. So one of the very wonderful things about life today is not only working in the same law firm with Mike, but also being able to see my kids on a regular basis and the grandkids that are in town. Mm -hmm. But anyhow, the decision to run for mayor uh, led me two years later, in mm -hmm. March of 1966, to leave Kramer, Marx, Greenlee, and Bacchus. I wanted to ask a couple quick questions about that race. Um, were there any other issues that were kind of brought to the fore, other than wanting to replace this one mayor that had been there? <laughs> you know, I, I don't remember clearly uh, independence uh, I remember running an ad with my three running mates that sh said no strings attached to emphasize our independence. There was a proposal pending at the time to build a motor vehicle inspection station in Paramus, and I was opposing that. I'm not sure why. Uh, there was the usual issues about resident about zoning and Paramus, of course, being a very uh, major commercial center. There were issues then about taxes and zoning. But I don't really remember uh, any single issue that was profound other than the fact that the Democratic organization over the last 10 years seemed to be very closely connected to the shopping center developers and there was the sense that the um, that the mayor and council should be more independent of the commercial interests. The town had a very good school uh, system at the time and it had a pretty low tax rate because of the tremendous commercial rateables in the town. So the, the, uh, the clearest issue that I can remember is whether we were going to be able to better serve uh, the good citizens of Paramus because we were independent and new and fresh and had good ideas about how to protect the residential character of the community because it is a very lovely residential community once you get off the highways. Mm -hmm. And of course there was a Sunday closing ordinance which everybody vowed to maintain. Uh, so I think I, you know, ran a, a vigorous campaign and, and I was aggressive but 
uh, I was very young and very inexperienced, and I had uh, not a significant connection with the Jewish community in Paramus at the time, which should have been supporting me had they realized that I was more liberal than the guy I ran against, but I don't think I got that much support from him. It was just a good lesson. It was a good early lesson, perhaps, that I wasn't uh, exactly geared for high public office, but also a lesson that demonstrated to me that I could speak on my feet if I had to that I did have leadership qualities. And of course, I always knew that I was willing to work hard. I walked the streets of Paramus for a year, knocking on doors and meeting people and trying to persuade people that they should vote for me. But I didn't understand that the national political trend would have such a big impact on a local election. I just didn't get it. And had I understood it, I would have spoken out more against Goldwater because I thought he was a terrible candidate. Mm -hmm. But I'm glad I ran. Uh, I learned a valuable lesson. I remember asking my brother to take my mother and father home early because I didn't want them to experience the pain of defeat. I had worked very hard on the campaign. Mm -hmm. and. The, the law firm had been very generous. They gave me time off to run and all of that. But at the end of the day, I think what I realized for the first time was that there was significant professional, commercial uh, activity on this side of the river. It was not as sophisticated. It was not as high-powered as the work I was doing with a Wall Street law firm. But I didn't like the leverage at the New York law firms. By that I mean uh, the clients were so big and so powerful that you got the sense that the law firm was um, dominated by the clients rather than the other way around. Now, maybe it's because our firm wasn't as big as some of the larger firms, although in those days, the biggest Wall Street firm was about 100 lawyers. Mm -hmm. And I got to know lawyers here in Paramus and Bergen County by running for mayor, and it became clear to me that the leverage was different because your clients were smaller businesses, <coughs> people buying houses, needing wills, maybe involved in a negligence case, or even if you were representing a municipality. It was a different leverage. A lawyer could be more independent, I felt, out mm -hmm. here. So I bit the bullet in... Uh, the election was in November 64, and I had a breakfast with Henry Marx in uh, probably January of 1966. And I said, Mr. Marx, I uh, think I'm going to go set up my own law firm in Paramus. And he thought I was making a great mistake. He said, you'll be a partner here. He said, you'll make a lot of money. He said, you have a bright future. I said. You know, I thought I might, but I, I think I'd be happier, be happier to be closer to my family, not having to commute, and uh, that's what I'm going to do. Charlie Fitzmaurice, when I told him, he said, where the hell is Paramus? I told him, he said, do they have telephones? I said, yeah. He said, all right, I'm going to be your client in Paramus. So he came with me couple of other clients that I had done work for in New York were nice enough to come with me. Uh, Henry Marx was a little upset that Charlie was going with me because they had gone to Princeton together, but Charlie explained to Henry that I had done all his work for the last seven, eight years, and so it was a natural fit. And uh, Charlie was nice enough to give me a $5,000 advance retainer so I could buy paper clips and stationery, and I opened up a little office on Ridgewood Avenue in Paramus 
East 64 Ridgewood Avenue on March 1st, 1966, scared to death, married with four kids. And uh, I said to Ed before I opened that I thought I would run for mayor again. And she said, like hell you will. She said, you can't do both of those things at once. You can't open a law practice and run for mayor. So I solicited and supported my dear friend Charlie Reed. Charlie had been the founder of the Paramus Public Library, served as a trustee at the library for 40 years, became the president of the New Jersey Library Trustee Association, the president of the American Library Trustee Association, was awarded the Dorothy Canfield Fisher Prize as the outstanding library trustee in America, never graduated high school, quit Palisades High School. He was a builder and just a wonderful guy and a wonderful friend. And he had been president of the Board of Education in town. And he was very happy when I told him I wasn't going to run. And he ran and I backed him. And after he won, he made me the borough attorney, which I'll tell you about in a minute. But when I opened up, it was, uh, it was lonely. I had a one-man office. I bought a six-pack of beer the first day. I ordered a pizza the first day. No, the first day I went home for lunch, and that said, do me a favor, don't come home for lunch anymore. So I <coughs> got the hint, but I was only five minutes away from the house, so it was wonderful. And I love not commuting, and it was a wonderful feeling to have your own office and to turn the key and open the door in the morning. And little by little, I built a practice. Uh, it took a while. The first year, I probably earned as much or a little more than I had earned in New York because I settled a couple of negligence cases that first year. And then in January of 1967, because Charlie had been elected mayor in November 66, he defeated Bob and Glima, the guy that beat me. Charlie appointed me borough attorney. It wasn't exactly a slam dunk. He nominated me, I think, three times, and there were four Democrats on the council, two Republicans. So I had three votes, Charlie and the two Republicans. And the Democrats all voted no, except one guy said, his name was Leon Luxemburg, he said, I'll support anybody the mayor names except Gary Stein, because he still was sore at me for running for mayor the last time. So Charlie tried three times to appoint me, and every time I was defeated, four to three. <coughs> Finally, on the 28th of January, 1967, we gave up because under the law, after 30 days, the council gets the right to appoint the borough attorney. So Charlie appointed Dick DeCourt, who's not with us anymore, but Dick DeCourt was a well-known assemblyman and they named a very significant facility at the Meadowlands for Richard DeCourt. And uh, Dick was a lawyer in Franklin Lakes and this fellow Luxembourg said, yeah, I'm gonna support DeCourt. So that would have meant three Republicans plus Luxembourg, that was four votes. So he was nominated, seconded, and then one of the Democrats who lived on my block, Roland Curley, asked for a recess. The Democrats went in the back room along with Roger Breslin, who was the outgoing borough attorney. And about an hour later, and I was in the audience with that, we were watching, because this was a big deal, because being the borough attorney of Paramus as a new lawyer without a flourishing practice, that would have been a big, big boost for me. They came back out, and Charlie withdrew his nomination to Dick to court, renominated me, and Roland Curley joined with the Republicans, as did a guy named Tom Donnelly, and voted for me. And Roger Breslin told me afterwards that he told the Democrats they were crazy, <coughs> that they shouldn't support the court, that he would be much more partisan than I would, and that they should support me, and they did. And I served as borough attorney 
for four years, from mm -hmm. 67 through 70, which probably helped to establish me as a, you know, fairly well-known lawyer in Bergen County. I was practicing alone then, but I had, wow, maybe three full-time secretaries and two part-time secretaries because the work for Paramus was a lot. And uh, it was a busy time. I was somewhat active in Republican county politics. Those were days in which Nelson Gross was the Republican county chairman and I had supported him when he ran for county chairman but then backed off because I didn't like the way the county was being run by Gross. And so I was kind of on the outskirts of the Republican Party, still identified as a Republican, but on the outskirts. Um, and so from 66 to 70, I was the Paramus Borough Attorney. Uh, we actually moved out of Paramus in 1968, which is 10 years after we had first bought a home there in 58, and we moved up to Upper Saddle River because I found a nice piece of property uh, that I thought would be good for the kids to grow up at. Uh, my fifth child, Joe, was born in 1969, and I ran a law practice. I continued to be somewhat active in on the fringes of Bergen County politics. I got more involved in public interest matters. I suggested to the president of the State Bar Association, Marty Haynes, around that time that he form a committee on state legislation because we had a committee like that in New York at the City Bar Association. And the function of that committee was to review state legislation that was passed by the legislature and send comments to the governor's council before the governor decided whether to sign it or veto it. Mm -hmm. And so Marty Haynes made me chairman of the State Bar's Committee on State Legislation, and I recruited 40 of the best lawyers in the state to serve on the committee with me. And I did that for about three years, served as chairman. Um, Was there like a particular piece of legislation that prompted that or no yeah. I was I, I thought that the bar ought to be more active mm -hmm. in the process by which bills become law and I thought that based on my experience in the city bar association that uh, the governor's council would benefit from memos that we could send about past legislation both commenting on legal issues inherent in the legislation uh, and, you know, perhaps making editorial suggestions about how the bill could be improved because the governor in New Jersey has the power to either sign, veto, or conditionally veto. So they could take our recommendations and use it as a basis for a conditional veto. And we worked on, uh, you know, uh, some very significant uh, pieces of legislation. I remember Byron Baer drafting the uh, first right to know law in New Jersey mm -hmm. and we helped him with that and we did a lot of good work. Uh, after I resigned as chairman the committee sort of fizzled but I, it was a it was a good piece of it was a good experience for me and my first opportunity to get more involved in public policy at the state legislative level. Um, somewhere, and, and in those years, after I finished being borough attorney, say from 1970 through 1982, which is when I left to join the Kane administration, mm -hmm. I built my law practice. I formed a law firm with a lawyer named Richard Curland. And we, the, the firm name was Stein and Curland. 
one of the lawyers who works here at Pashman Stein, Scott Lippert, was a lawyer at that firm. We had three or four lawyers at the most. And we had a general practice, a small town practice. Uh, Dick represented a bunch of builders. Uh, at that time, after I stopped being borough attorney, I was frequently hired to represent people that had developments or commercial buildings that they wanted to build in the borough of Paramus, so I did a little of that work. The uh, town manager of Teaneck, Werner Schmidt, hired me as the Teaneck Board of Adjustment Attorney, and I served there from about 1972 until I went down to Trenton. Um, I was playing a lot of tennis because I didn't have to commute anymore, so I hooked up with some guys up in uh, Upper Saddle River at an indoor tennis court, and I would play doubles in the afternoon. Now I play singles, uh, but at that time I didn't have the time to play singles. So it was a nice life. My kids were growing up. I was, you know, close to the family. Uh, we had moved to Upper Saddle River. It was a good time. And I maintained uh, a casual relationship with Governor Kane, who by this time had come back to New Jersey and was elected to the Assembly in 1966. Mm -hmm. I ought to mention that in the year that I became borough attorney, I guess uh, that was January 67, November of 66, I had been offered an assembly nomination by Nelson Gross, the, who was then the chairman of the Bergen County Republican Party. But uh, one of the Republican councilmen in Paramus also coveted that opportunity. Mm -hmm. So he said to me, if you run for the assembly, I can't vote for you for borough attorney because I don't think you can do both. Mm -hmm. And he was probably right. And at that time in my life, being borough attorney was a more important opportunity because I had four kids mm -hmm. and I needed to build up that law practice. So I declined the opportunity to run for the assembly. I think I made the right decision. And so the years from 66 to 70 were very busy when I was borough attorney. The years from 70 to 81 were less busy uh, because I was just a small town lawyer and a father and uh, not terribly active in politics until 19 let's see, 77, Tom Kane decided he was going to run in the Republican primary against Ray Bateman for governor. Mm -hmm. And I helped him to the extent that I could in that primary. I didn't take a major role in that primary, uh, and he lost the primary. Uh, but I was on the committee and went to fundraisers and went to rallies and helped as much as I could. Um, we were in closer touch then because he was out of the legislature. He had served in the legislature from 66 to 76, and in his last couple of years he was the speaker and had had a real leadership role in the legislature and we had had conversations when he left the legislature about his interest in being governor. And so in the late 70s, it might have been 1980, there was a election for Bergen County Republican chairman, probably one of the dumbest things I ever did. But I threw my hat in the ring and ran against a guy named John in Ganimort, who was a very wealthy, powerful Republican. He was the current chairman. And it was a three-way race between John, myself, and Harry Randall. 
and I deliberately injected myself into the race because I thought I might be able to be more help to Tom if he ran an 81 if I could win. And I came close. I came within 50 votes. But it was a bad fit. I was not meant to be the Republican chairman of Bergen County. I don't like fundraising. I don't like being a partisan. It was just a bad idea maybe with Maybe with a shred of, of, of good motivation, but I shouldn't have done it, but I did. And uh, I lost, learned a lot, met a lot of people. And when Tom announced in 81 that he was running in a Republican primary with six opponents, because of the work that I had done running for chairman in 80, I was able to help him substantially in Bergen County. In fact, a good friend of mine named Hank Conway, who was a real estate broker, uh, made available his real estate office to us, and I brought Tom in to Paramus, and then made appointments for him to meet with all of the members of the Bergen County Committee. That's like a thousand Republicans, mm -hmm. county committee members from every one of the 70 towns in Bergen County came in to Paramus to meet with Tom. And he stayed there for two weeks and shook a lot of hands, but it helped him enormously in the primary. He lost Bergen County because the organization led by Ingannamort was behind Pat Kramer, the mayor of Patterson. But even though Tom lost Bergen County, he won by enough in Ocean County and Morris County and other counties to be the best, the, the high vote getter in the primary. And so he got the Republican nomination for mm. governor uh, and he would be the candidate to run against Jim Florio in November of 81. And I was very active in that campaign. I liked Tom. Tom and I were philosophically compatible. Mm. Uh, he's probably a little more conservative than I am, maybe a lot more, but we, we had very common views about a lot of issues. He was well known as an environmentalist when he was in the legislature. Um, he uh, had a, a, a tremendous sense of, of public integrity and uh, was, was a very decent and, and um, uh, not a uh, not a highly partisan candidate. He got along with people from both parties. Um, during that campaign, when he ran against Florio, uh, Tom would frequently be way behind schedule because he would stop to spend time with reporters and people that he'd meet along the way. And I remember the Wall Street Journal ran a story by a reporter who had called Congressman Florio, because he was then a member of the House of Representatives, to ask him to have lunch with him, and the message came back, Congressman Florio doesn't eat with people during the campaign. Mm. Well, Tom would stop and talk to anybody. It didn't matter who you were. And that characteristic, that trait that he had of being available and taking time to answer your questions and meet with you won him the support of so many of the reporters that covered the election and I thought was responsible for the fact that he got 18 of the 21 newspaper endorsements in the 1981 election. Hmm. Let me uh, just stop for a second to note for the record that um, you have given this interview to uh, Eagleton in 2009 that goes into great depth of your relationship with uh, Governor Kane, your involvement in the, the campaigns, as well as your years as director of uh, uh, policy and planning. planning. Yes. Yeah. Um, so I, I don't want to uh, rehash a lot of the stuff that, that's there. People can refer to that. Um, but I do have a few questions about your uh, time in the Kane administration. Sure. Um, Particularly related to uh, the Supreme Court, if it's if it's valid, um, you know, Governor Kane appointed uh, uh, justices. I think uh, Justice Garibaldi was Correct. was one. Um, he appointed her in his first year in yes. 1982 when Justice Pashman mm -hmm. retired. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Uh, were you involved in, in that at all? Did I he... was not. Oh, yeah. Nor was anybody else in the administration. Okay. Tom Kane kept his counsel completely to himself, and everybody in the governor's office was astonished when, she, at least to my knowledge, nobody knew in advance. Mm -hmm. Marie at the time was a wonderful candidate for the court. She was the, pres the first woman president of the State Bar Association. She had been a partner at the Riker Danzig Law Firm. Uh, she was much beloved in the bar. People liked her because she was such a warm and friendly and kind and thoughtful woman and a very bright, pragmatic individual. And she had helped Tom in the campaign as well. So I was not involved in the selection, mm. did not know about it in advance, but was delighted for Marie when she was appointed. Mm. What about um, the process of, of taking a nominee through you know, confirmation and all that? Who, who would handle that within the administration? You know, I think Harry Edwards had more to do with that, but the truth was there was nothing controversial about Marie's nomination. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, she was a shoo -in. There was nobody that said anything negative about Marie Garibaldi and to my recollection, I think she was confirmed unanimously by the state senate. But I think if anybody had that responsibility, it was probably Carrie, who was counsel to the governor and worked much more closely with individual legislators than I did, mm -hmm. which was, you know, part of the definition of the jobs. Carrie had been in the legislature and the governor had selected him to be counsel because he wanted somebody with direct experience in the legislature in that job. My job was more of a substantive policy-oriented job. Mm -hmm. So you you were nominated in 1985, or was it later in 84? In November 84, actually it was October 1984. Uh, I got the call from one of the state troopers who was with the governor on Columbus Day 1984, hard to forget. I had just come back from playing a couple of sets of tennis with Hank Conway. Phone rang, and it was one of the troopers who was with the governor. said, the governor wants to talk to you. And I got on the phone. Tom said, you exchanged greetings. And Tom asked me, uh, Gary, do you have a current resume? I said, no. He said, well, could you put one together? I said, sure. I said, why? He said, well, I'd like you to bring it to the office tomorrow, because we were closed for Columbus Day, because I want to nominate you for the Supreme Court. I said, I could do that, Tom. So I did, and he did. It was, it was not a shock, because other people in the governor's office knew I was interested in the nomination, Greg Stevens in particular, mm -hmm. who was Tom's chief of staff, uh, I think did a lot of the uh, preparatory work to make sure that, uh, that I had a clear field. We were good friends. Uh, but I had never had a conversation about the court with Tom during the time I served in the administration. Whether we had talked about it earlier, I don't remember. I mean, as a kid in law school, the New Jersey Supreme Court was a very special institution. Mm -hmm. It was, in my judgment, the best state court in the country. It was a pioneering court in the common law, decided some of the most um, innovative cases around the country. And I'd always had a very high regard for it. So it was something that I thought would be a great way to <clears throat> uh, cap my career as a lawyer, but it was not a subject I was going to broach. I knew there was a vacancy coming up when Justice Schreiber uh, would reach retirement age, which was in, I think, November or December of 1960. Uh, I'm sorry, 
November, December of 1984. Mm -hmm. So he sent my nomination to the Senate the day after Columbus Day in 1984. I was confirmed in December and I was sworn in, <clears throat> I think maybe January 6th or January 8th, 1985. Uh, right behind you is a picture of me and my five kids on the day of the swearing in. Mm. Uh, but that was a very exciting and special time in, in the life of my family and me. Mm. Yeah. 